Welcome back to another episode of Where Are All My Friends. This week's guest is Ryan Scott Graham. Ryan does a whole lot of stuff. Um, it's extremely impressive. I'm just going to list off everything he does, and then as you listen to the episode, you'll understand the pieces and how it all fits together and how he stays so busy and so motivated. But he plays bass in State Champs. He is the entire musical project of Speak Low If You Speak Love. He is an incredible film photographer, and along with that, there's a project called Another Rush of Blood. He also finds and sells really cool vintage clothing and has a store associated with that called the Gallery Grail. On top of that, he's just an overall great human being, uh, one of the funniest people I've met. He's way too good at Mario Party and way too good at Settlers of Catan. All around, like he has an incredible story. He's a very cool dude, uh, very inspirational, motivating dude, just to see how much he's always doing and how much he cares. There's a level of detail and care in everything that he does that I think is just incredibly cool. So I think that all of that combined leads to a very, very good podcast episode. I think you're really going to like this one. Uh, I'm going to keep this intro pretty short and just get into the story. If you do like this episode, please subscribe and rate the podcast. That's the best way to help grow it and get it discovered. So it really does mean a lot to me. Let's get into the episode. I am good if you are good. I'm chilling. All right, cool. So I'm really excited that you don't know the format again because like we're friends and we know things about each other. Yeah. But... I feel like this format will be really fun because every time I've done it, even being with a friend, I learn something new. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, like let's just kick it and see what happens. Let's go. All right. So the first place that I always, always start is like, tell me just straight up, like, where are you from? I'm from Westland, Michigan. Okay. Oh, whoa. So you're not only born in Michigan, but like you really spent a lot of born your life. Born and raised. Wow. Born like raised. actually. Yeah. And you ended up in... Outside of Detroit? So, yeah, I was born in Westland, Michigan, small town, uh, went to high school there, and then commuted to college from there. And then when my parents just decided they were done with Michigan, I wasn't. So I moved in with a friend in Livonia, which is about 15 minutes away. So <laughs> Wait, wait. Your parents were over Michigan, and you didn't? Where did they go? They literally moved while I was on Warp Tour 2014, just moved while I was on tour. What? And all of my stuff just ended up at my next door neighbor's house. Where did they move to? They moved to Georgia. They were just over Michigan. They were over the cold. F for whatever reason. Yeah, they were over the cold for sure. But my dad just got super into mountain biking. And it's just like, <laughs> I can't really do that here. That's not real. You're, you're <laughs> on a warp dude. tour. Your dad gets into mountain biking and he's like, dude, I'm out. Well, I don't know that he just got into mountain biking like while I was on warp tour, but like it was, it was, a, it was a slow thing. He like bought a GoPro and like wanted to start a YouTube channel. Like he was taking it super seriously. No way. And, uh, then they just moved and, uh, I was virtually homeless, came back from warp tour 2014 and moved into my girlfriend's mom's house at the time, my girlfriend at the time. Yeah. But she was living in Florida. So I was living at her mom's house and she wasn't even there. Oh my. It's just so funny for me to hear that because normally like the story is you grow up in your hometown, you grow up wherever you're from and you're like, dude, I'm fucking over this. Like yeah. get me out. Like as soon as you're 18 or even earlier, especially touring, you see other places and you're like, I'm going anywhere else, but for you, you're like, yo, Livonia, let's go. Well, it's not that I certainly loved Livonia. I love Westland in a, in a, like, this is a trashy, like, very crap place to live, but for whatever reason, it's charming to me. Yeah. But for me, like, when I was on tour, all I wanted to do was be back in a place where I was familiar, or when I'm done with tour, like, I yeah. just wanted to be back in a familiar place, Yeah. kind of low-key, my friends that I don't really get to see very often, you know how it goes, so... Yeah. Uh, yeah, I never, never really wanted to go away. I actually do get that in the sense of like, if you started touring at an early enough age to like have that where you could see other places, you really do appreciate the low key town more. Of course. Yeah. I always, I always appreciate the low key town though. Yeah. I still, in my head, I'm still thinking about, I, does your dad have a YouTube channel? Can I watch his GoPro Dude, he definitely videos? has a YouTube channel. I don't know what it is, but his Facebook picture is just a mountain bike. <laughs> Because of the GoPro shot? No, it's uh, not. It's a graphic. It's <laughs> it's not his mountain bike. It's just a mountain bike. 
Holy shit, that is amazing. It makes no sense. We need to find it after this. We will. I'm, I think he, I don't even know if it's a, like, it's not even his name. It's probably like, like a business page. Wow. With like just maybe like 20 extreme likes. mountain bike, uh, mountain biking physics. That's what it is. Oh my God. Cause he's a chemist and he's very into science and he, the physics of mountain biking, that's really what it all boiled down to all right check me out maybe we just call him and we just do the pod with him on the phone we'll switch it over we'll talk about the mountain but <laughs> he'll be completely uninterested <laughs> don't eat, it's not worth it holy fuck okay so um you answered where you're from and all that but the next part or like what i like to kind of figure out because i find this so interesting and i think everybody has a different story of like where something clicked but like somewhere around like call it like eighth grade or whatever like mm. You're kind of like a teenager, you're growing up, you're finding like actual hobbies that you care about. And I always find like that point in people's lives super interesting of like mm -hmm. typically that brings them to around where they're at. So like take me back to somewhere around that. Like what is that, Ryan? Like middle school, high school, sure. like what are you into? Middle school, Ryan was very into baseball. I was actually a baseball player. Oh, wow. Uh, that was my thing. That was my hobby kind of growing up. Always loved music, but baseball was what I played. Very competitive. Uh, I was on, you know, city league teams. And uh, I think when I got to about ninth grade, I tried out for the baseball team and just absolutely hated the the coach. Just he was I there was just something about him that just seemed like maybe he sleeps with students or something. And just I just like couldn't, a shitty dude. I just couldn't like couldn't get over that and uh so really, honestly, that was kind of what pushed me away from baseball. I, I thought that was going to be what I was going to do probably for the rest of my life. Were you good? I was good. Yeah, I think I was good. I don't think I was great. I don't think I was like major league level. You know, obviously not at 15. Mm -hmm. Nobody really thinks that unless you're Bryce Harper. Um, that's a baseball player. Thank you. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> your eyes tell me that you have no idea who that is. For the listener, my eyes communicated, I have no idea who Absolutely Bryce Harper not. is. Um, but yeah, I I, uh, I thought I was good. I, I, I performed well. I could hit well. I could run. Um, and then when I stopped playing, uh, I kind of was like looking for something else. And uh, around that same time, probably like eighth grade going into my freshman year, mm -hmm. I went to my first local show. And that's when I really fell in love with music. Oh, wow. And so kind of that that also had an effect on it. I was like, maybe <clears throat> this is what I want to pursue more than baseball. But And like, what were you like as a kid? Like, you were playing baseball. Like, how did you find that first show? Like, did you have hmm. like, were you good in school? Like, were you the good kid? Was that like, <laughs> did you find like school or like, did you find that show? And you're like, oh, shit. Like, I don't know, like what was the Ryan like? Like what were, was your personality like at that oh, time? Oh, I was a, I was like a total shithead for sure. Really? Like, I was a bully in, in middle school, I think. No shit. I was, yeah, I mean, I really loved hip hop. So I kind of dressed the part. I Whoa. would wear big baggy jerseys and sweatpants and, you know, the South pole that my mom, you know, took me to JC Penny. Dude. To get. Yes. The echo. Did you have any like, Oh echo yeah. I had some to... echo. I had some fat farm FUBU. Yeah. You know, all the stuff. Did Jinko and Cabo, uh, Jinko was not Cal really my style. That was okay. kind of still more like industrial or something for me. Maybe okay. like too juggalo. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, uh, Oh, dude, I was definitely a bully in middle school. I think I was kind of like, thought I was cool had a lot of self-esteem issues so i took it out on other people loved hip-hop like i thought that, that was like kind of characterized me and and i was like supposed to be kind of like a tough guy what i didn't have artists. anything i didn't have anything figured out but i thought i did well yeah that's every fucking kid in of high course school, but of course what uh like what kind of hip-hop like what were what were i mean i'm from to? detroit so i loved eminem you oh know? my god growing up eminem was like when did marshall mathers me. lp come out how old were you like, what year did that come out? 2000. 2000 I think it was 2000. 2000? Yeah. I mean, I was 10. Okay. So, but I can, re I can specifically remember uh, having a, like a boom box with yeah. the radio station uh, in my room. And I had a cassette tape, uh, cassette deck on it where you could record audio from, you know, whatever you were playing onto the tape and play it back later. So I would wait up until like 
midnight or one, for whatever reason, this radio station around me, I can't remember what it was called, would play unedited versions of certain rap songs after hours. So at like one o'clock in the morning, they would play, you know, Slim Shady unedited. And that's when I would wake up and I would put the tape in the tape deck oh and my record God. the song so I, I could listen shit. listen back to it. And uh but I had to do it late at night, not only because that's when they played the unedited, because I could I could have taken the, the edited. That's why yeah, but where but my the... parents were sleeping and they didn't know that I was listening to Eminem. Yeah, no, you like at least for me, like because I was about that same age, like I think 10 when that yeah. came out. And I wasn't allowed to listen to it. So like you had to like find the friend that had the CD or like do what you did. Dude, that's so true. I but you're not gonna believe this. My parents were were pretty conservative. Yeah. They kind of had like a they kind of knew what I was doing at all times. And I bought, I think the first CD I actually bought with my own money, I think, was the band Together. Have you ever heard of it? They're a boy mm-hmm. band. They're literally an MTV making the band. Oh, boy whoa. band. Okay. And they were like a joke Backstreet Boys. So whoa. they had songs about like squirting and like, like very, but like it's hidden in the lyrics. It's vague. Okay. Whatever. Okay. So it wasn't like full, like raunchy. No, boy it wasn't band. like Tom Green. It okay. wasn't Jackass. It was, it was like you had to. You had to seek out what they were saying, I but see. it had a parental advisory sticker on it. So how, whatever, whoever at Best Buy sold me the CD didn't realize I was like 13, whatever. My parents confiscated that CD from Because me of the sticker. Because of the sticker. Dude, yes. And I wasn't allowed to listen to it. Dude, it, it was a boy band. It was a pop. It, they didn't even, I don't even think they swore. Dude. Maybe they did, but. I think about that now, though, because it's like with Spotify and with everything available, like, I mean, obviously it sucked for us and we found our ways around it, but like, that's not a thing anymore. Like you can have the internet and it's like, yeah, cool. You can have anything you want at your fingertips. There's not censorship. Absolutely. It's it's crazy. But okay. So you are hip hop, Ryan. Yes. I love that. We need to dig up photos, but there's a lot of love that. Then you go to this show and what kind of show was that that you went to? I was at youth group. I was at church youth group on a Wednesday night and my friend was wearing a shirt. It just had like a little, it was a tiny, it was like a faded black t-shirt. I'll never forget it. It was a faded black t-shirt, you know, like obviously it was extra small because that's that was what the, style. the scene style was at that time. You know, skinny jeans, girl jeans at that time before yeah. skinny jeans and super small shirt. It was a faded black shirt with a tiny graphic on it that was like of a spaceship and it just said the great basement crusade. And I just, I had to know what it was. And he was like, Oh, it's this local band. Uh, they're actually playing this weekend. Do you want to go? And so I went with him. He was my friend, like one of my best friends, but we had completely different, you know, hobbies and things. Yeah. Um, he was like a church friend. Yeah. Um, you know, not somebody that would hang out with at church. That was like my best friend, whatever. Anyway, I went to the show with him and was in a you know extra large t shirt and super baggy pants and like Air Force Ones. I was, did not fit in that scene at all. The Midwest, yeah, you know, skin tight everything uh, scene, and fell in love with like it was like a festival type thing. There was probably like ten bands that played, and I was just obsessed, dude. I was like, guitars are awesome. Holy shit! Yeah. So it was like. That was your first exposure to it. Like you knew hip hop before clicked, that. It clicked, dude. It clicked, man. Like I mean, I listened to I listened to stuff because my sister, I had an older sister and she was, you know, I would put my ear to the door like whenever she was like listening to music. I didn't want to bother, but I wanted to listen to what she was listening to because I thought it was cool. Yeah. Um, you know, and she would be listening to, you know, Third Eye Blind and, and you know, the the 90s rock gods. And yeah. so that's why I kind of still love that music today, like maybe even more so now. But I was a hip hop guy before that. I didn't know anything about local music. I didn't know that there was even a scene like that was not on the radio. That what you just said right there mm-hmm. is such an in, like it's such an insane part of like cuz I felt that too. Like I was into skateboarding and cars and my mm-hmm. friends were the kids that were in music. So like I knew music on the radio and like I knew I had found like I had ordered a Blink-182 and a Green Day CD from one of the mail-in CD catalogs. Sick. Yeah. And no effects, but like, so I knew those bands and I liked them, but 
to me, it was just like, okay, there's the radio and then there's this good music that I found. But the idea that you could go in your city, see people play music like that. Yeah blew my mind super nuts and to me at least it didn't feel like i didn't care that they were worse or i'm sure going back like thinking about those local shows it was terrible but to me just seeing that music played live i was like this is the coolest shit oh for ever. sure i thought they were rock stars yeah you know? like they were on a stage you know there's probably 50 60 people there like it wasn't this massive thing no but like that but they were pouring out like real authentic energy that like i don't think i had ever really seen before that and i didn't even like you just were mentioning Green Day and No Effects and stuff like that. Like, I didn't know those bands. Wow. I didn't grow up like listening to like punk rock music. Right. You had hip hop. Yeah. But I, I knew like Blink 182 because, you know, some friend, I knew that they were a band that I was not allowed to listen to. Whoa. Because they were, you would sing about dicks and stuff like that. Funny that you were even mm. able to listen to hip hop before that. But it was, it was kind of like, it was just, uh, I was doing it on the low, you know? Yeah. Or I would find, like, Christian rappers. Oh. Uh, which exist. Yeah, no, totally. DC Talk, baby. Like, that's, Jesus Freak. I was a Jesus Freak. That's crazy. Yeah. Okay, well, okay, so you super answered that question then. So you go to that show. Yeah. And it just fucking clicks. Yeah, man. I think I, like, asked for a guitar for, you know, my next birthday or something like that. My mom bought me an electric guitar, no amp. So she was like, you have to learn how to play this before... I hear it coming out of an amp because Whoa. I don't want she basically she was just like, I don't want you to just suck all over the place and it'd be loud in my house. <laughs> so I would strum the strings so hard and just break them because I couldn't hear them. It's an electric guitar. Like Yeah, it's quite gonna, shit. If you want me to learn, like give me an acoustic or something. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. But I uh, like that logic. Just like click, I get where dude. she's coming from. She's a smart woman. Yeah. And it probably did inspire you to keep going with it, right? Yeah. I mean, I fell in love with, that's kind of where I started learning about those other bands, like the not mainstream, but, you know, punk rock kind of stuff. So I, I took a couple guitar lessons and I did, like I said, I didn't know what I wanted to learn. So when I went in there, my teacher asked me what I wanted to learn. Like, what bands do you like? What songs do you like? And I was like, dude, I don't really know. Whoa. And so he was like, I'm going to show you what I like. Yeah, and he told told me about Jimmy Eat World and uh, Weezer, and like those were some of the first bands that I learned how to play some of their songs. Whoa! Shouts yeah. to that teacher. I know he killed it. That's fucking Luke. cool. Thanks, Luke. Yo, Luke. Um, damn. And how old are you then? So, like, did baseball end? Had baseball ended? Were you out then? So yeah, my freshman year of high school, I kind of just stopped. I tried out for the team, and I ma I made the team, but then I think I just quit mm -hmm. at some point. Much to my dad's chagrin, like he was not, he was really bummed about it. I don't think mm. he understood that I'd like found a new love. So he thought that I was just going to like be, you know, a lazy rebellious teen or whatever. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that was like our family thing was coming to my baseball games. Oh, and so fuck. maybe that did, that kind of like started going away. Yeah. Um, and, uh, I forgot what I was saying. We, we were but, talking about like you found guitar. You oh, started yeah. playing guitar then. Started playing guitar at that point, And that was, you know, that's that's kind of where I started writing songs. I just would lock myself in, away in my room and write songs and started listening to, like, Dashboard Confessional and the Goo Goo Dolls, like, really, like, kind of emo. To me, it was super emo, like, when I would listen to those lyrics. And that's those were the songs that I was trying to emulate when Whoa. I first started writing songs. And the other cool thing about that is, like, as you're finding this entire new genre and learning to play guitar you don't have the internet readily available to like give you new music. So like, was that even like a quest finding new bands to inspire you and like finding dashboard and like, how are you even finding new music? Well, that was the cool thing about the community that I had found, you know, through local bands oh. because I, dude, I'm t when I'm, t when I say this, I mean it. I was a punisher. I was an absolute punisher. Like I was the kid at the show that, would show up and be so excited about this new world to me that every band thought I was annoying. I was that kid. Holy. I would try to befriend them because I thought they were so cool. They were so much cooler than anybody I had in my life at that point. I dude, I remember like stalking them, stalking them on aim, like getting their instant messengers yes. and just being like, dude, whenever they're online, like I have to be like, 
what's up, man? How's it going? Like, dude, I would sit at the computer and just be like, I'm waiting for these people to come online because I want to pick their brain. I want to know what it's like to be a musician. It's so fucking crazy too. Cause like, obviously like we're friends and all that, but like talking about this, it really makes it so real. Like I was born in 90 and you were, same. yeah, yeah. that is so real. Cause we're on the exact same page of like, I remember that so vividly of like you or a, even a friend having the aim screen name of someone that like you thought was like famous oh, yeah. or like up there. And like, dude, it was like, yo, like, what are you doing? Oh, tonight I'm going to talk to this person. It was the most accessible thing, you know, like, you know, it's that person on the other end. Yeah. And even if they don't respond, what you put it, put across was like important to you, dude. And so I, I was like messaging these like nobody bands. They're, these these bands are playing for thirty people a night. Like yeah, but that doesn't matter. I know, but yeah, to me, yeah. I'm like I love this band. I love this music. I mean, Grey Basement Crusade, this band called Sandbox Heroes, Mercury Shoes. Like these were like the bands in my scene that nobody listening to this podcast will have ever heard of. I'm almost I'm, I'm almost positive. Yeah. But those bands were everything to me, and those mm-hmm. people in those bands were so important to me that I was like, I have to become friends with these people because I don't know how to get past the point of just playing guitar in my room. Like I want to learn yeah, and I want them to know that I'm serious, whether I come across as like a freakazoid or not. Like, yeah, that didn't matter. You were just no. so in it. So, okay. So how far from, getting your guitar to being like the concept of a band and now like you want to be in a band or like, when did that happen? I mean, when I first started playing shows, like my first show was a solo acoustic show. Okay. So, I mean, it's funny when people see speak low now, they think like, Oh, this is cool. This is Ryan's band. Like that's where it all started. Like I started writing songs by myself. I started performing by myself. It was in a band called the dry leaf project. And, uh, that was like my high school band. Wow. And so that kind of slowly turned into a full band thing. So dry leaf project was you solo. Yeah. And was that because no one else would fuck with you because you were punishy Ryan? No, no. I think at that point when I started playing those shows and like people were like, Oh, he's writing good songs. Like we're taking him more seriously now. Okay. So those people, I, I eventually became friends with them. You know, mm-hmm. it was one of those things where I really did weasel my way into those friend groups. And so now looking back, I I think it's so funny because, you know, there are people in my life where I'm like, man, if you didn't try as hard to be my friend, we probably would be friends. Mm-hmm. But I was that guy. Yeah. And so it does kind of, it, it feels like humbling yeah. to a point or where I have to like, I have to take a step back and say, you got to be a good guy. Yeah. Like you, you know? remember what it's like to exactly. be the kid that's so excited and all you want to do is learn and you don't realize, or even if you do realize that you're being mad, punishy or creepy, you're just that excited. Yeah. So like when you feel that now you're like, God, give it back. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so honestly, like I, I am, I'm kind of happy that I did grow up that way because I really do think it's, it's, it's been instilled in me up to this point where, I'm I'm better at it than some other people I think that are in my life now. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I started writing songs, playing them just because that's what I wanted to do. Yeah. I thought it was like, I don't know, the Ryan show, I guess, kind of. Yeah. But then when I started writing other songs that I felt were that needed to be more than just a guitar, I get got my two best friends to play. Mm-hmm. Dry Leaf Project goes through a couple different. Um, lineup changes and whatever, but I mean, I th- I think we were taken pretty seriously in the scene for like a little while, and that was my band in high school. Like I pretty much did that from ninth grade until maybe two thousand uh, t- two thousand ten. Oh whoa! So yeah. yeah, like you put time into that. It was probably yeah four years. I mean, we put out three records and like you know obviously all independent, and then we broke up. And I honestly thought I was probably done with music for a little while. And I started Speak Low. Whoa. Just just writing like casual songs, whatever. Mm-hmm. And about the same time, I joined another local band called Good Luck Varsity. That The Dry Leaf Project and Good Luck Varsity, they were like best friend bands. Oh, okay. And so I 
it only had a couple Speak Low songs written at that point. Maybe I had an EP, mm-hmm. and then I kind of put that on the back burner and and did Good Luck Varsity full time. Okay, because that's like, I guess that kind of brings me to like the first bits of meeting you or anything like yeah. that. Um, so I didn't know anything about Dry Leaf Project. So it yeah. goes then to Speak Low. You're doing your own thing. Thought you were done with music and like, at- just didn't take it seriously. Oh, really. okay. You know, Speak Low was like, okay music i love music but it's just it's not my maybe it's not my path it's just for fun so that's an important piece though because you say you're doing dry leaf throughout high school yeah so did you do college was there a feeling of like okay well like what's next like now i have to figure it out yeah i was doing college i I mean i went to college um college took me six years to graduate because i dropped out twice oh but you graduated yeah graduated graduated in 2014 um Actually, hilariously enough, the first Champs tour I ever did, I was doing my last semester of college online. Is that the tour we met? Yeah. Oh my God. So you were still in school just about to graduate. I was in school on that tour. Holy shit. Yeah. It sucked. What was your major? I English major. Okay. It, language, literature, and writing, I think is what it was, but English. Yeah. In a ball. So did you have an idea of like where you would go with that or was it just kind no, of like... No, I was doing... I completely signed up for college because my parents guilted me into it and also because my band ended and I was just like... I was in a really vulnerable state where I just didn't know what I wanted. I knew that I did not want to do uh, school. I yeah. knew that like I wasn't really interested in that. but And I wanted to do music, but I think I was just defeated at that point you know when a band breaks up that you put so much energy into even though it was my first band you just felt like a huge breakup felt like you know you're not going to come back from that and so maybe i started speak low to say that it was going to be you know just casual songs here and there but you know i knew something was going to come later yeah i don't know that's so interesting to me because like that like if you actually put yourself in those shoes of that Ryan, that's kind of scary. Like you're finishing high school. You know that you don't really care about college. Yeah. The band thing didn't work. You're in Michigan. Like you don't have that much exposure to that much other cool shit. (laughs) Yeah. So like, what the fuck do you do? Like, did you like, did you have a profession in mind or like, were you just working random jobs? Yeah. I mean, I kind of at that point had put all my eggs in that basket you know, I didn't know that I was going to join Good Luck Varsity at this point, but it worked out perfectly because, like I said, we were like the best friend bands. Like we yeah. would play all of our shows together. They were a much better band, I think. <laughs> but there was something about us that kind of like made sense together. When we would play shows, people would come out for both bands and just be like, "I love these guys," you know. Dude. And so when it when I made the transition a couple years later, it made made perfect sense. Yeah, I was the merch guy before that, and then. You know, join the band, dude. So it was kind of cool, you know, in that way. But yeah, dude, I was working. You know, I worked delivered pizzas. I worked at PacSun. I, you know, I was working anything, any little job that I could to have some pocket change to go on tour with. Dude, I love that piece so much because, like, I would have to imagine that if there is a listener out there that is at that age of like school music, whatever, like at least I remember like these feelings of like, you know that there's something so sick, but you have no fucking idea how to connect it. Yeah. And you're just grinding in mediocre bullshit. So like hearing that, like you really did go through that. Like you truly know what it's like and, and we'll get to it, but like you're proof that you can get out of that. I mean, dude, even when I joined good luck varsity, it was like, this is a maybe even more respected band than I was in, Mm -hmm. you know, that has, done a couple tours you know dry leaf project we probably i think we did two tours ever what was that just like weekend regional we did one weekend tour and then we kind of did like a two and a half week tour so it was not it it was nothing like really substantial but um so when i joined good luck varsity dude i was reflecting on this the other day like we played pretty insane diy touring you know we did we did the diy touring for a long time where we played for almost nobody like yeah. pretty much every night but for whatever reason it was worth it you know dude just that feeling and like again at least from my memory and my experience like first meeting the set it off dudes and going out 
like again these small local shows it even comes back to going to your first local shows mm. and seeing live music when you're so dialed into something that you love it's not about the flex of like how many kids show yeah. up it's just like if you're on tour and you're with your best friends and you're making music you believe in and there's fucking one person if the bartender is watching you that's it yeah so like you fucking felt that you did that it was it was a it was a different kind of feeling for sure you know it, like <laughs> You would go out there every single night. And what I think people kind of started to realize about our band is it it really didn't matter how many people were there. We were going to go out there and sweat our ass off and give a great show every single night. Yeah. And that's what people who kind of, when they started gravitating toward that band, they that's the compliment that they would pay us. You know, like you guys have a very authentic feeling about what you're doing and it's easy to see. And yeah. that's why I like your band. And so for me, that was the best compliment that somebody was paying me because I'm like, you know what? That's cool because we play 90% of our shows for less than five people. You know, like yeah. when we play a show where people are there, we knew we were going to shine. Like we knew we were going to kill it because we were a damn good band. And like we went out there and put it, put it out there. Yeah. We left it on the stage. And I loved doing it because I'm like, we're writing good songs. We're playing them good live. Do we were doing sampling and stuff before like any local band, we were doing three part harmonies. Like we were out there sounding pro fuck. And that came from a spot of just fucking caring. Yeah. And it's just funny because we would play those shows to nobody and be like, damn, if there were people in this room, we would be crushing. Yeah, And so then, yeah, it, it was just that much more meaningful when we would play those shows when there were people there because they would come up to us and say, I don't know who you are, but I'm 100% buying your record. Fuck and that man. was the coolest thing because, you know, that's what opening a big tour now is all about is like being that kind of unknown band, really winning over the crowd. Dude, winning over the crowd is still one of the best feelings ever. I mean, Damn. there's nothing like it. Like... If you have something and it's real, you're going to win over the crowd. Yeah. I love hearing that because, like, I'm not an artist that performs on stage. And that's a perspective that I've literally never heard. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I just did that, that Speak Low tour at the beginning of 2018 yeah. on the Neck Deep t run. Yeah. We were the opening band. And, uh, you know, like, coming from the pop punk world, being in state champs, I, I thought a lot of people would know that I had another band. I just thought, you know, yeah. like, if you like state champs, you're probably aware of what's going on. Yeah. And it shocked me that so many people that were at the shows had no idea. First of all, I had another band, or sometimes some didn't know who I was, which was awesome, because that's cool. then I didn't really feel like, oh, they like this band because they like my other band. The fact that it was a genuine like, whoa, I've never heard of your band and you were the opening band and I thought it was awesome and I came over and bought your CD. Dude, that's what we we were like. Before every set, we would like put our hands in and we're like, we're going out there and we're selling 50 CDs tonight. Like we're gonna we're gonna win over 50 new people. Yeah. And or like sometimes it would be more, sometimes it'd be less. But like that was the hot that was the adrenaline rush of that tour was how many new people can we bring into this circle? Because we have something that people want. Yeah. They just don't know it exists. Just like that challenge of like giving it everything yeah. and showing people that have no idea what it is, just how meaningful it is to you. And it's so easy to write off the opening band because you didn't come there for them. Oh my God. So if you see somebody that you'd never heard of and they blew your mind live, you're like, I can't wait to get this record and put it in my CD player and like, see what it's all about because they just kicked ass. Like you, you only imagine that their CD is better Yeah. because you, you're, you know, you can do whatever you want on a CD. If you can pull it off live. Yeah. Great. Fuck. So, yeah. That's awesome. Okay. So then I'm just rambling. Dude. No, no, no. But it's like the rambles like this to me is like, I just, it's so real. Right. Cause it's like, I know it from the side of like being grindy band, trying to make it. But I just like, I would hope that there's listeners out there too that are like trying to start something and like to have somebody like yourself who's actually made it and like now like does this for a living. I feel like there is something so fucking special about knowing how real it was for those people and like the thick of it. 
where it's just like, yeah, it sucked. Like it wasn't yeah. just instant. Like, I think that's such an important lesson. So ramble all you want, <laughs> but, um, the next part is good luck varsity. So you end up joining, you're doing speak low college. You're kind of just doing it on the side. Yeah. Then good luck varsity is happening. Obviously you're doing college too. So yeah. is Good Luck Varsity touring? Is it just weekend stuff? You're fitting it in around classes, all that? Yeah, Good Luck Varsity would do, you know, pretty pretty hard summer touring. We mm-hmm. would we would do like a two month tour. Yeah. Over the summer. But yeah, for the for the remainder of the year it was just, you know, Thursday to Sunday, like touring. We would try to hit, you know, Midwest or we would go out to Pennsylvania, New York. Yeah. You know, sometimes skip class and just do a week tour or something like that. But wow. we were touring pretty much nonstop. Like I would say every weekend. Yeah. You know, we owned a van, we owned a trailer. We were very serious about it, even though we knew we were playing for nobody. I remember hopefully gas money. No, like living in Florida, that was a band name that would come up. Like Florida was one of the only places I think we could play that (laughs) there would be people there. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we would go out to California or not California. We would go out to Pennsylvania. We'd go out to Florida, play a really good show that would pay for us to be able to play six other really bad shows dude that's and then come home with real. no money yeah yeah no but like that's it like you could stay but you could be like all right we have three four terrible shows but we know that long island is gonna do great yeah. or we know like you know your markets yes uh, stroudsburg pennsylvania <laughs> was one like where you williamsport could, pennsylvania was one for us get there if you knew if you could yes. just get there you were gonna make it or you would try to find like a college that was willing oh to like use God. their like whatever budget yes, on you. Dude. You're like, dude, we made two grand on this college oh show. My God. It's gonna pay for us to literally play for nobody for the, the next whole two tour. weeks. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God. Okay, so that you're in it, you're touring. So that kind of explains it in my head then. So yeah, you're doing college, but the idea of figuring out like a career like your head is still in the game of touring. Like you're still a musician. You're just doing college to keep your parents happy and right. just it's there. Yep. So then the next crazy shift is obviously you end up joining state champs yeah. and you're obviously not in good luck varsity now. And you said that your first champs tour, you're still in college. So yeah. when did you leave good luck varsity and what was like the gap between that and champs? So good luck varsity, we recorded a full length record in 2013 Mm -hmm. and then kind of broke up before it even came out. Mm. Um, there was just, you know, band differences between the guys in the band and we just wanted different things. And we were kind of burnt out. Honestly, we felt like we had been doing it for so long and we were writing good songs and we were putting on good shows, but nobody was caring. Nobody was paying attention. Yeah. And so it really did get to a point where it was just like, man, like honestly, how much longer can we do this before we start, resenting each other yeah like being this close to each other and being so in like a negative place yeah so we kind of broke up and just the record you know it's on spotify now which is hilarious but (laughs) it it didn't you know get any it didn't get the recognition that i thought it would have because it never came out um but so we break up i work on a speak low record and i put that record out independently at the end of 2014, oh, that's wow. everything but what you need. That was the first record Is I that ever the did. One with the Buffalo, yes. Whoa! But that was that was the Pure Noise re-release. So there, okay. I put I made I probably did like a hundred physical copies because that's all I could afford. Yeah, and put that on Bandcamp, whatever. And then so that came out in December 2014. I joined Champs January two, 2015, or sorry, that came out December 2013. I joined Champs January 2014, so the the next next month. month. So that's why Speak Low once again kind of went on the back burner. Oh, my God. Until 2015 when, you know, I'd kind of, I'd been with the band long enough, Pure Noise kind of trusted me, and they offered to re-release the record for me. Wow. Yeah. Because that's another point about your story that I'm so interested in, and I didn't know about this until not that long ago. I didn't know how much of a piece, because for the listener that doesn't know, you play bass in Champs. Yeah. And there's definitely some stereotype to like people playing bass that are just kind of like there for the ride. Or like, I can definitely, like, you can just play bass and like be the one that's like, (laughs) oh, I got stuck with bass, whatever. Like, there's that, but that's not you. Like, you know, it was. 
It was. Oh, it was. I didn't even own a base when I joined State Champs. Well, no, what I'm saying is like you you were more of a songwriter. Oh, yeah. You were not just a bass player. Okay, I see what you're saying. I thought you so, were like, oh, just any old fart can play the bass, mm-hmm. which, you know, which is what I thought. You know, right. I was like, I play guitar and I write songs. Like, this is going to be a breeze for me. Dude, it was hard. Whoa. I remember at the end of like my first tour with Champs, my yeah. hand was cramping up so hard because I had no technique. I didn't know how to play it. I was playing so hard and it was hurting my hand. Like I actually thought, I'm like, dude, I don't know if I can play bass. I don't know if I can do this. Whoa. Because I was just not doing it right. Like I didn't know what I was doing. Yeah. Well, cause that's fucking crazy. But then the other piece that I didn't know is like, I guess what I was trying to explain and it's a bullshit stereotype, but like I didn't know that you were more than just bass. Yeah. Okay. So like you're an entire songwriter, like speak low is more than just an acoustic thing. Oh yeah. And like you as Ryan Scott Graham, like you write all sorts of music. Sure. So how long was that a theme? Like, were you writing in good luck varsity? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I've been a songwriter were, since the beginning. I mean, yeah. like when I said when I got my first guitar, it was just the I never really learned songs. I just wrote my own. Mm. And I think, you know, that's probably why I'm not as good of a player as I am, you know, or as I could be. But I know my shit. Yeah. Like and I think I developed an original style because of that. Because I wasn't copying anybody else's. I wasn't really learning those songs i'm like oh that's how these chords are supposed to go to like with each other i was just kind of figuring it out yeah um but yeah man i i was i've been doing it all since the beginning and and that was that was a really new chapter for me really champs champs yeah because it originally put you just in the yo join this band yeah play bass i remember like stressing out about it so hard when i was i was in one of my classes in college who i had i had you know gotten a couple friends because mm-hmm. i was the class clown like just i was the kid in the college class that was not taking it seriously yeah would raise my hand to make a stupid comment to make the class laugh and the teacher would hate me yeah but i would get a's so they couldn't really say anything to me Dude. so i had a couple friends and i remember when tyler like called me champs tyler yeah yes yeah. he called me and said you know we want you to try out for the band yeah we're basically kicking out the bass player and we don't have any other option so it's like it's not even really a trying out it's like you got it if you want it you just have to come here and play with us did you guys know each other from all of your touring like from when you were in no we actually just met through like a mutual friend and she was saying you know i know this really great guy who you know, you should be friends with. And so we kind of became friends. Tyler, I think, was a fan of Good Look Varsity or Speak Low or whatever. And they were looking for somebody that could sing harmony mm-hmm. and uh, just be like a little bit more active in the band. Yeah. And so we became friends briefly over the internet. And I came to see them on like a Bayside tour or something. And they okay. stayed at my house afterwards. And we just stayed up all night talking. Oh, cool. And so it wasn't really like we had this storied friendship it was just like uh we clicked and i kind of just threw out the line and said if you need somebody ever consider me because i'm serious about this music thing yeah and then it was just like a month later he he hit me up and was like we've got this full u.s tour with we are the in crowd coming up the tour we met the tour we met on but i remember in college i was i would talk to my friends and say like dude this band from new york wants me to try out I know that it's drastically going to change my life. What do I do? And they were like, you're an idiot if you don't do it. It was really those people in my classes I I wasn't even really friends with that were like, you have an opportunity that, first of all, you've probably always wanted, but now you're like kind of just being a baby about it because you've been doing it for so long that you're like, do I start over again? Wow. And they were in New York, and I was just like, everything in my life is going to change. I'm scared. Holy shit. And so like you really did need the perspective of everyone else. I needed somebody to just kind of talk some sense into me because I was afraid of losing my relationship that I was in at the time. Yeah. You know, I thought I was going to have to move to New York. 
luckily it turned out that I didn't have to do that, but I'm like, I don't have any friends out there. You know, everything in my life is going to be, be different. And what if I don't like it? What if I don't like playing this? What if I don't like playing bass, you know, because that wasn't my, you know, that wasn't my first instrument. That wasn't what I was passionate about. And so it all just kind of fell into place, I guess. Holy shit. Because, yeah, in the beginning, when you end up joining, was there any discussion or was there any idea that you could become, like, a, a main song writer or any piece of that? Or was it just kind of like, yo, like, we need somebody to play bass. Like, no, come dude, through. I was the hired hand for a yeah. long time, you know, and that's kind of what I felt like. Not that they, they made me feel like that, but no. I was just playing a record that I didn't write anything on, that I didn't really know even before I joined, the like, the band. I just listened to it nonstop and was like, okay, I got to learn these songs. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, I mean, I had no idea where it was going to go. And funny thing is, like, I joined State Champs thinking that they were already, like, a big band. Yeah. Dude, we were, the we were you know, two of five on that that We Are The In Crowd tour that was playing for, like, 300 people at night. You know, it wasn't this massive tour, but to me, I'm like, okay, this is big compared to what I've been doing, but I thought they were already bigger. Like, I thought I was joining this, like band that had it made i didn't know anything about being on a real tour yeah that's so crazy because like again i was on that tour and like i didn't know champs before then Mm -hmm. but at least from my perception of seeing like the tour gets announced and it was i believe can i do the line we are the in crowd set it off we are the in crowd william beckett william beckett set it off set it off champs Candy Hearts. Candy Hearts. Okay, yeah, William Beckett, yeah. So at least to me, even with Champs Build Below, Set It Off, who I was with, it was still enough of a band where I had heard, like, there was a hype to it. Yeah. Like, I was like, like, it was in this weird way. It was almost like, yo, like, pop punk. This thing pop punk is coming up. And it was like, here's this young band that's doing it different. Um. So, like, even though, like, I agree with you, like, even though it wasn't massive yet, there was a name to Champs. And I can understand being sure. away from it and, like, still, like, people felt the energy quickly. For sure. For sure. And and I think, like, Champs probably would have been one of those bands that when I was in Good Luck Varsity, I would look at them and be like, we could be doing that. Like, we should be doing, we should be able to headline for 100 people and sell out, like, you know, sell out a 100 cap room. Like, we should, like... I remember we played a show with like handguns. I think it was in Good Luck Varsity days. Yeah, we we opened for handguns, and I remember when we got the show, I was like, "Dude, this is gonna change the trajectory of this this band's yeah. career." Like thinking that that was gonna change the tra- like that's crazy to think about now, because those bands were just doing the same thing but had a little bit more, dude. And that's what Champs was, you know, at the beginning of the t- like, dude. None of those people that were coming out to those shows, maybe. I would say 30 people a night were coming out for champs. Yeah. After that tour, the people that we met on that tour were at every tour for the next two years. Yep. That tour changed our lives. Like that was, those were the people that were supposed to be, that were looking for something else. Yeah. And that was champs. And you know, so not, not seeing, not, not knowing like, what our presence was on that tour. And then we went and did a tour in Europe with uh, the Wonder Years, and it was kind of the same thing. And then Warp Tour 2014 comes around, and that's when I really noticed, yo, all these people are here that we saw on the We Are The In Crowd Tour, yeah. and all of their friends, and all of the fans that we already had. Like, That's when I really started seeing, I'm like, okay, something is happening. There were like positive signs, like signs where you could actually be like, okay, cool. It's yeah. clicking. It's connecting. We were getting bumped up to like the journey. I mean, we were on Kevin Says, which was, you know, the the smallest stage, I think, yeah. you know, for bands to be playing that that tour. Yeah. We would get bumped up to Journeys. And, yeah. uh, you know, some days like the crowd would literally be too big. Like they were like, this isn't safe. Like there's too many people here. Yeah. We need to put you on a different stage. And so for us, we were like, yes, this is sick. Like the coolest shit is just happening right now. I remember that too. We didn't know. Because like we had become friends. Like yeah. that tour, like we really clicked. Like I remember all of us rode in your guys' van. We did like the Redwoods, yes. like the Northern, the Pacific Coast. We did that together on yeah. our off day. And I rode with y'all because you we were so our excited breaks. to do it. Oh yeah. But totally worth it. But right? it was super worth super it. Super worth yeah. it. But like 
we had just become friends. And then I was out on Warp Tour 14 by that time working for Equal Vision. And I remember it. I watched it. Like you're explaining it on your side, but I remember watching it and yeah. like seeing the crowds and being like, the fucking boys, they're doing it. Yeah. And like, I even remember, I think you got bumped to like main stage and I crowd surfed. I was so happy. I was like, I'm crowd surfing for the boys. I remember. I remember. That's yeah. fucking sick. So, and it's crazy to me too. Like, cause I watched that at that point. Now everything you're explaining, I've seen it from a, like from afar. Sure hearing you explain it and it clicking from your point of view is fucking amazing. So Warp Tour 14 happens and I saw it. I felt it. Yeah. You clearly did too. So keep going with that story. So the vibes and like the energy level must have been amazing. Yeah. I mean, the finer things had kind of just come out. So I joined in, like I said, the beginning of 14. The finer things came out at the end of 13 in October, I think. Yeah. So I wasn't a part of writing that record, but I was riding the wave, you know, because the record came out, it didn't crush immediately. Once we started gaining fans, you know, obviously people were like, oh, this record is really great too, you know, started t- taking notice of it. And so I kind of was on that, those coattails. Like I didn't write the record, but I'm in the band now and I'm yeah. doing the the cycle of this record. So, you know, we started noticing the, the growth on Warp Tour and then we would we did the Pure Noise Tour where it was, you know, a co-headline with handguns. And uh we ended up playing like last every night because mm. it just for whatever reason we had that hype that, you know, it was it was like kind of overwhelming for a co bill. Yeah. And so we were we we said like, you know, if you want people in the room, it, it sounds like arrogant right I now know. saying it, but it's- like we were like, if you want people in the room, let us play last every night. Yeah. Because whatever we're doing right now is working. Yeah. And then, you know, we got an all time low tour the next year. Wow. And obviously that is really, I think the tour that kind of set us up where we are now. Like that was so monumental for us. Yeah. Because really, I mean, we did have a lot of people that were coming out from the, we are the in crowd tour and warp tour that were, that were coming to see us on this tour. But yeah, I mean, those were 3,000 cap rooms that we were playing for 95% new people. Wow. And so, you know, like I said, about winning those crowds over, we went out there and we were like, let's be the o- best opening band that we can be. It was us, Tonight Alive, Issues, All Time Low. Awesome tour, looking back on it now, like super cool from top to bottom. That is cool. But we were the band that were, that, that straight up said, we're going out there and these fans are going to be ours because... We're, we we kick ass like we're killing it right now yeah. and we all knew that we all knew like it was happening for us like in our little bubble mm-hmm. but we were ready to pop like a different bubble yeah and that was you know all time low trusted us and and like kind of you know now that i see how how tour packages and stuff go you know when you're building one you're like okay we want the one of to be a hype band like somebody yeah. that's c- causing some buzz right now and we were that band. And so it's really cool now. Like, you know, we just finished our our uh, headliner for uh, Living Proof. Yeah. And, um, you know, Grayscale. Like, oh, wow. It's cool because we kind of were like, hey, Grayscale is maybe at the point right now where we were on All Time Low a couple years ago. Dude. And it's, it's awesome because they came out there and every night we're crushing. They and it was it. even more, like, there was way more of a reaction for Grayscale on our tour than there was for for us on you know all-time low wow it's funny because nobody knew our words unless they were people that came to multiple dates and then we would see those people in the front row same ones that were sleeping like the first and second and third show bored waiting for all-time low they were singing our songs by like the seventh show but check that out that's actually fucking awesome perspective because two things that i noticed in that story is one the progression of what you just said from early 2014 into Warp Tour, into touring with All Time Low, going overseas with Wonder Years, like that, you were the underdog for all of that. And even to just be put in the position, because like building a band's year and getting tour opportunities like that is not easy. Yeah. Like you have to be the hypiest young one of right. band to get those. So you guys did that. You accomplished that. But then it's also this weird thing where you have to, understand that you're the hypey one of band but then you also have to stay extremely humble yeah and work your fucking ass off 
and make every one of those shows count. Oh, it was, and you did both. It of was those a grind. Things. It was still a grind. It was not like we were just going out there and then like after the show, just like sitting down drinking a beer. And no, it was like we're going out and we're meeting every single person at the merch table and we're saying, "You like the show? Thank you. Yeah, I'll see you next time. What's your name? Okay, cool. I'm gonna remember it. Yeah, because that is that's so sh- important. That shit matters. Like I, I think. The bands that are still doing that, and the bands that are that are doing that, you know, at a lower level, mm-hmm. those are the bands that, and, and I hope that they're they're you're doing it in a genuine way, yeah, and really actually giving them the time of day because you you care about people on a on a you know a level like that. But that's important, you know. Like your fans want to be seen, they want to be heard, yeah, and and you want to say genuinely thank you for letting me do this yeah because without you it's such a cliche it's so annoying to say like but without your support yeah it's it's not gonna go anywhere well dude it's like i think about that and it's like yes it is cliche but if you think about it outside of bands if you think about it with business so many people have written books all about just that like Mm -hmm. it's not whack when you genuinely need it it's like your customer word of mouth like a positive referral right like you think of all these industries and they can do all the marketing and all the promotion they want. And at the end of the day, the most successful marketing tool for them is positive word of mouth, people telling their friends. So it's like, that's not new to music. And it's like the fact that you're caring about fans and all that, when you actually care is like, it's the way that every business and entity should run. It's Mm -hmm. like, there's so much competition. There's so much fucking noise out there. Like without that care, why the fuck should you be there? Yeah. So, I mean, we did it. We we've we still do it, you know. And and like I remember, it would be we would stand outside the van for hours after talking to like the six people that were like stoked. Yeah. Until it literally was like we have to start driving now, or we won't get to the show the next day. Yeah. I mean, I remember doing that that tour, you know, that pure noise tour in in a van, and just like staying until one o'clock in the morning talking to those people who wanted autographs and just like kicking it. Yeah. Because it's so true. You know, if, if, if people feel appreciated for appreciating what you do, Mm -hmm. it's just like a cyclical thing that, you know, they, they, they flow into each other in a positive way. Yeah. And it's cool because you really do make true friends that way. And for me, you know, touring and being able to make music, that's, that's one of the, best things that's come out of it for me you know traveling is awesome and being able to you know make art for a living or you know even if it's not for a living just being able to do it in general awesome but like making friends you know making friends that are outside of your hometown that you probably would have never met otherwise it's been the coolest thing in the world that's so fucking cool so damn so that brings you to like 2015 and i mean not to like fast forward the champ story but like there's a lot of that right like there's a lot of just extremely logical growth of like you kept grinding you yeah. kept caring you kept doing the next tour taking the right opportunity getting lucky though too yeah i mean like again like i know your manager nick and like shouts to him like yeah. i think that like he had a lot to prove during sure. the whole process and like he worked his fucking ass off like everyone liked him and he like just did everything right. Absolutely. Like I think you had the right team behind yes. the scenes too. Like not only were all of you guys in the right spot and have the right mentality and writing the right music and playing it and winning fans, you also had a team all around you For sure. where your agent cared about you, your manager cared about you, your label cared about you. Everyone had the same amount to prove and then you backed it with a good product and care every time. That's true. That's true. I mean, that's a good way to put it because you know, when I was doing the DIY thing, I didn't realize that bands had teams. Like yeah. I didn't know anything. Yeah. And so when I joined Champs, I was like, "Wow, now I really understand the importance of having people behind you that maybe know a little bit more about something than you do." Yeah. Or like, you know, you might know about this music and the art or the direction or something, but you don't know how to book a good show. Yeah. Or you don't even know how to get a guarantee for a show. Yeah. Or, you know, how do you have somebody market you? Mm-hmm. Blah, blah, blah. Like, there are people there that 
that are willing to do that for you. Yeah. And in Good Luck Varsity, we were just like, no, we're doing everything ourselves. Why are these bands getting, you know, opportunities that we're not? It was really about having a good team. And so, yeah, I, I 100% agree with what you said. Like, we, we've had the same team since day one. And uh, we were kicking ass, but they were kicking ass behind the scenes. And yeah. it was just like, it was a machine that, that was just running really, really well. Yeah, it was. And then another piece that I'm curious of is when does Ryan, you, <laughs> Ryan, third person. That's me. Um, when, when do you start writing with champs? I started writing on the second record around the world and back. Okay. Um, like everybody was aware of what I was doing with speak low Mm -hmm. and they knew that I, you know, could bring some songwriting like skills to the table. Yeah. And I think I remember the first time I like got the opportunity was I was writing a riff on 2014 warp tour. Mm -hmm. I was writing a song for, uh, speak low or what I thought was going to be speak low yeah. and it ended up being the riff for all you are's history because oh, wow. Tyler heard me playing it and he was like dude that's sick like we should use that for a song and I was like okay I don't really know how to make it pop punk yeah because like what I was doing was you know tuning my guitar really funky and like playing you know midwest emo style like sad sounding shit and he, he was just like oh dude I'll just turn it into like power chords and it'll be good and that's you know, after that, it was like, okay, yeah. I'm allowed to write. Like, wow. I'm, and I'm good enough. Yeah. So it really was like I needed the appro- – I felt like I needed the approval of somebody to just be like, hey, man, we picked you for a reason. Like, we want you to contribute. Yeah. And so that was that was cool. That was a good feeling, like a, a reaffirming thing. Yeah, that's so fucking cool. Because I know now, like, you're a pretty big piece of writing, right? Like – yeah. When it came to the last album, Living Proof, like you were a huge factor in that, right? Yeah. What yeah. is the writing dynamic? I mean, it's it's very collaborative. It's still yeah. everybody, you know, putting their best foot forward. But, you know, at the end of the day, whoever's got the best riff, whoever's got the idea yeah. that we want to expand on, that's what, how it happens. That's cool. And I just kind of felt like I really wanted to... I want it to be credible. Like mm-hmm. credibility to me is, is important because it, you know, you, I don't want to put out music that doesn't have a foot to stand on your legs to stand on yeah. whatever the phrase is. I, I want, I want people to listen to me and be like, this is good. Yeah. Like not, it's not just hype. It's actually good. Yeah. And so for me, it was bothersome to be in a pop punk band because people just think any idiot can play pop punk. Yeah. You can play a power chord. You can play a fast beat. You don't even have to be a good singer. It doesn't matter. And I was like, I don't want to be in a band that's that people say that about. Right. Because so, that bothers me. Because yeah, like, I know I'm a songwriter and I yeah. care about this. Here it is, like the band is clicking, but then it's like you don't want it to click and it to be clicking for the wrong reasons right. and then get stuck with just Well, that. I mean, I always think that, spe- that, that State Champs was head and shoulders above that because you know Derek is an incredible singer and there was you know some dynamic songwriting but yeah I was like okay for living proof I really want people to listen to this and be like they know how to play their instruments and I've said this in interviews before like that was actually my goal like I knew we were going to write a big chorus for every song and it was going to be catchy but I want guitar parts that are hard to play yeah i want people to listen and be like that's a cool bass line i want evan's drum drumming to to shine through because the dude rips like yeah i want someone to undeniably listen to it and be like first of all this is a good record and whoa like this isn't just power chord stuff like this is a pop punk band that's like more than that yeah and that was actually my goal for this record damn well i'd say you fucking did that thank you yeah okay so that tells so much of that story The other part that I mean, like, because again, like we met in 2014 and like, it's funny how many parallels of friendship we've had. And it's funny to me because like, I look at you and it's like, yeah, cool. Like Champs is a fucking awesome thing that you have been a part of that has definitely like pushed your life outside of just getting stuck trying to tour in Michigan. Yeah. But like you have done so many other things. So all of this is happening with Champs. All the success is happening. You put out another Speak Low record with Pure Noise. Yep. 
And then I think you toured on that a little bit, right? Or maybe I did one tour last year. Okay, but that wasn't Buffalo album was called what? Again? That's everything but what you need. That was a re-release, came out right. in 2015. Did you tour again on that? Or I no? did some touring on that. Uh, okay. You know, a couple tours here and there. Okay. But nothing crazy. And then, though, you wrote another album. I did. I did that. Yeah. But I was I had been writing it since, like, 2014. Like oh. That, Speak Low is, will always be that slow project because it's just, you know, I do have a lot of stuff going on, but at the same time, it's, I can't write songs like I, I, it's hard for me to write songs that are that like emotionally driven, I guess. Yeah. And just nail it in a day. Like those songs, some of those songs are like four years old, man. Whoa. Or like pieces of them were, you know, like I wrote this riff, you know, in 2015 and, you know, kind of just like, I cultivated it a little bit here and then I would come back to it. And, and, you know, like I never really gave up on the ones that I knew. But that's so existed. fucking cool because it's like actually your passion project. Like you have yeah. the time where you can do that. Right. It is cool. But, and it's frustrating at the same time because yeah. I know people want to see me play shows. Yeah. And I really just don't have the time. Yeah. And so I'm like, I wanted to be able to give somebody a good enough record to where maybe that didn't matter. You know, yeah. like, yeah, I want to see him, but, like, I really love this piece of music, and it's going to satisfy me because the music is what matters. Yeah. So. Because that, tell me the name of the album one more time. The first record? No, the full. The new one. Yeah. Full, the new full length. It's called Nearsighted. Nearsighted. Yeah. Because that, dude, like, when I listened to that, it was, like, this whole side of, like, you know when you're friend, like, you're friends with people, and then you see them do something, and you're, like, oh fuck like you're like good at this like i'd <laughs> fuck with you regardless because i like you but then like right. you're like oh but like, this is like i just fuck with this it was that feeling with that album where cool. like dude i like i don't even remember when but like finding like copeland for me and like oh, finding yeah. like emo music like was a after blink 182 and all that sure and like just that album and like there was emotion in that like that was something real oh yeah that one was a that was a hard one for me to get out yeah. It was cool because everything but what you need was one of those where it was like, you know, I wrote the song and I didn't really revise it at all. I just kind of wrote it. And when I finished it, I said, there it is. Yeah. And like, there's something to be said about that. You know, it was very raw and vulnerable because it was the first draft. Yeah. This one was different in a way because I really spent a lot of time on like every single song. Yeah. To the point where, you know, I, I, I was like, it has to be 100%. Like, yeah. I didn't care about the first one really being 100%. If people like it, they like it. Yeah. This one, I'm like, people are maybe kind of anticipating something, and I want to be able to deliver something. So that's kind of where it, where it is. Right now, I don't know what I'm doing with Speak Low. Like, I have some songs, but I don't know what it's going to be like. But that's, like, the best part, right? It is. It's It's scary because... You know, once you put something out and people are receptive of it, mm -hmm. you always feel like there's this pressure to kind of outdo it. Yeah. And I think as an artist, you should want to mm -hmm. and you should strive to do that. But th but it's still it's still hard, you know, because you kind of pit yourself against yourself. Yeah. Because I don't want to be like, oh, I wrote this song, but it's no, nope, it's not as good as this song on Nearsighted. Yeah. Like, no, I mean, if it's a song and it's supposed to exist for somebody, you know, it's, that's just what it is. So I'm kind of, I'm going through a lot of like, I think mental roadblock right now. Interesting. I mean, I guess from the side of not only now as a genuine friend, but like as a fan of the band, like, or the project, I, I'm so excited to hear that you're even thinking about more of it and doing more with it. So that's cool. Appreciate that. Yeah. It'll happen one day. Good. <laughs> um, Any Speak Low fan listening right now, I'm sorry. I'm just going <laughs> to say I'm sorry in advance. Dude, you don't have to be sorry. Just play fucking Nearsighted over and over again. That's fine. That holds up. We're I good. Know. I need to do a tour on it. People, yeah. I said, I said, I tweeted, I think, a couple weeks ago, if I don't tour on Nearsighted this year, you can kick my ass. Oh, shit. And that was probably like my my most shared or like liked 
retweeted tweet on the Speak Low account because people were like, okay, I will. Like, be, I actually will because you did one tour on it last year, you asshole. I will be personally sharing that tweet. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Go hit it with a retweet. Just give it some more life. That sentiment as well. <laughs> um, okay. So, another thing about us that I think has brought us close as friends, but is just another cool piece is like, we are hobby people. Yeah. When we find hobbies, we we, we latch go on. Go in. Yes. So a couple, like again, there are so many dimensions and layers to just your life. Like you are so much more than just Ryan from Champs. So Speak Low is an entire fucking life in itself. Yes. Then there's this other thing where we bonded over photography and yeah. not just any type of photography, but you found film photography specifically. Right. When was that? That was, so I think I really started getting into it around 2016. Okay. And, or was it 2017? I think it was 2016 Warp Tour. Um, honestly, it's it's so crazy. It's kind of like a full circle thing now. Uh, our photographer, Beth, who shoot, shoots champs, you know, yeah. pretty regularly, she was the one who kind of like pushed me to get my first little point and shoot and, you know, kind of taught me you know, this is good film. This one would be good for you. I, I bought the exact same point and shoot camera that she had, yeah. the same film stock. And I was just like, okay, not that I want my photos to look like hers, but hers are cool. And I want to be able to, to get that kind of quality. She set whatever. a standard. Of course. And it was cool to be inspired by somebody who was, who was really good at their craft and like She's encouraging you to do it. And, yeah. you know, she was like, you got to get this camera. Like it's 20 bucks on eBay. Like just go get it, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, oh, it's not really, you know, like price isn't a, isn't really a thing right now. What's the camera for the listener? It was a, um, it was a Nikon light touch 130. It was like, I think I bought it on, on eBay for 15 bucks. Yeah. And then I was just shooting like Fujifilm superior 400. That's great. And I shot that for, you know, like the first year and a half. Yeah, I broke the camera and then I bought the same exact one on Depop. Yeah, I broke that camera and bought another one. I bought the same camera three times because first of all, I was afraid. I'm like, oh, I'm getting good results. Like, I don't want to do anything different. Yeah, but at the same time, I just didn't know how to. Right, and I'm like, okay, point and shoot is good for me because it's exactly what it is. You just point and shoot. You don't have to really know about anything, and the pictures tend to turn out pretty good if you're taking a photo of something that's interesting. Yeah. So yeah, I mean that was kind of the beginning. She just she set me up on a really good path, and then I kind of I think film was good because it helps you if you haven't done any photography before. It helps you really discover your eye and what's important to you and what's worth shooting. Yeah, because you get one shot. You know, and it's funny because I was just gonna say that like my mind thought of two separate things that I wanted to talk about on that line. Of sure. One, I want to nerd about nerd out a bit about your current gear because I saw that you did upgrade, but I think more importantly than that is like even your earliest, earliest film that you shot. Cause again, like, you know, I'll shoot, like I'd say like amateur as a hobby, but like little bits here and there. Sure. Right? But like, I really deep dove and did a lot, but like seeing you start, there was something about your eye and your vision and what you were shooting where it just like instantly, I was like, Oh, he's going to be good at this. Like, cool. There was so cool. <laughs> There was something like, you know, like you just like, there's something very special about like what you see and the things that you chose to capture. Um, it was just really like simple stuff that I thought was pretty. Honestly, that's what it was. It was like, I'm a fan of everyday life. Like, you know, the authors that I like aren't really talking about anything too memorable or too significant. The songs that I like are like talking about a really minuscule thing in a very grand way. And that's kind of how I approached photography, I guess. Like just like shooting things that aren't really special or kind of maybe even ordinary, but you see them differently and you can kind of tell a story that way. You just blew my fucking mind. Really? Because dude, like again, for me shooting photography, like it was more of like, it started with cars, right? And Mm -hmm. it was very much just like, get the cleanest shot, get the colors perfect, all that. But I'm not a songwriter and I don't consider myself like a creative artist in that sense. But the way you just explained that 
you view photography the same way you view music. You're telling a story through that photo or the detail that you're focusing on. That literally just blew my fucking mind. Cool. Oh, yeah. I mean, like, you know, I, I would read a lot of like, you know, Bukowski or like Hemingway or Salinger, like those artists, those authors, they're talking for the most part about nothing or a small detail about something that they did throughout the day or saw. Yeah. But they would describe it in such a way that you were like, this meant everything to them. Why? I don't know. But there's emotion there in a, in a way that like maybe a normal passerby would just be like, Oh, that's just whatever. That's just a girl yeah. tying her shoe. But like, you know, Bukowski walks down the, the, the road and sees a girl tying her shoe, shoe falls in love with her. And then it's just everything that he does throughout the day is just like trying to get her out of his mind or something like that. Yeah. And I just, I'm like, Oh, that's just a nothing moment that you could just walk by and that wouldn't happen. Or, you know, like writing a song about just like, I don't even have an example right now, but just the small moments in life, I think actually are usually worth like more than a one second glance. And that's kind of why I I really like photography in that way. Dude, I feel that so like, it just makes so much more sense. And again, like another part of like your life is like, I feel like, and you can tell me when, but like there's definitely a love for Japan Mm. and like, you combining film photography with Japan, because like I fucking love Japan too, and like your vision, what you were seeing, what you were yeah. capturing, the way you were telling that story, fuck, cool man, yeah, yeah. I, I, dude, that's I feel like if you're a photographer, that's it, you're you're dead in heaven. You're like you've gone to heaven if you go to Japan. It's just it's sensory overload, really. I mean, the lights, the people, the architecture, the food, like. Everything is interesting. And yeah. I tell this to everybody that I kind of, when they ask me, like, why do you like Japan? In in the most, like, simple way possible that I can explain this to them, everything is an adventure. It doesn't matter what you're doing. It's an adventure. And that's why I really like it. And for photography, it's just, like, perfect because you're seeing things that you probably haven't seen before. Yeah. Or even if they are everyday normal things, they're different. They're way different there. What I was going to say about that is like, I love the way you explain it as an adventure. The way I I always say it is just better. My one word is just better. (laughs) But like, true. with it, the fact that there's so much going on and it is this adventure and sensory overload, again, it's like what you capture is almost like the most simplistic things where it's like just the perfect symmetry of a road or like a, a person like one person or like it almost makes Japan just feel like this quiet, simple place where there is that side of it, but there's also fucking everything for sure. I think that's important to, to, for people to, to realize though, because I think when a lot of people who haven't been there think of Japan, they think of Tokyo, like that's all they really know. Yeah. And for me, you know, like becoming friends with some people that live there and, getting outside of Tokyo and seeing these like really actually small, smaller places, villages, like there are so many quiet parts of Japan and like so many just like mm, just special moments happening. Like at every, at every moment there, there there are those special things happening. Like I would just stumble upon those sometimes and just be like, wow, like I'm the only person that's seeing this, even though there are how many fucking people that live here. Like that's, that's what was crazy to me. And so that was what, like, what would make a picture worth taking is like, I'm the only person seeing this right now. Wow. At this moment. That's so fucking good. And it's cool. So then this connects to another couple hobbies and, or not even hobbies, but just like things that have become a part of your life of you start taking photos, Mm. shooting film. Um, you then made a zine. Is it Zine or Zine? It's Zine. Is it Zine? It's Magazine, short for Magazine. Zine. For those listening, a lot of people don't know that it's short for Magazine. I'm glad I, that I made that mistake. So then I anybody am else that has made that mistake later on will not feel so yes. bad. It's a learning It's a learning thing. Together this is a, we have this educational right here. This is PBS. Zine. Uh, yeah, it's a Zine. Yeah, I just was like, what do I do with this? all these photos that I took? Like, what do I... 
I mean, I can put them on Instagram, but I felt like just having a physical piece of something was cooler. Yeah. And then like doing it limited, like only making a couple. Yeah. I was like, if you're a collector like I am, that that was that was important to me is like having it be like this collectible thing because super fun to collect. Dude. I don't know if you collect, but I do. I mean, for me it's Magic the Gathering. Love that. Even with car parts, like building cars, like yeah. every now and then you can get a certain set of wheels or a steering wheel or like a little piece right? that's a little hard to find. It's it's fun. Yeah. So that that was part of like really trying to incorporate like everything that I really like into like projects that I do is important to me because that it, that is so cool. It's important. Like it's I think it's something that's like overlooked. If you are just kind of putting out like not to say that it's a half assed if you don't think about every aspect, but thinking about every aspect, yes, it can be stressful at at times, but I think it's the best like it's the best thing about making something is just being like, okay, everything was every every box was checked, you yeah. know, and so you know, as small as it is, and like I don't think it's an uncommon thing to like make a zine limited, but like. I'm like, dude, I'm going to make 50 of these and I'm going to make four of them and maybe you can collect them all. Yeah. And that's what I did. And I just made my fourth one and I'm like, done. Like, I don't know what I'm going to do now, but. Oh, it's done now. That series is done. I mean, the Another Rush of Blood series is done, but Whoa. I want to like, you know, I want to turn that into something a little bit more. Yeah. And so that's why I kind of started doing getting into like clothing and. Which was my next question. Yeah. So like with that. And again, like I feel that in you, like all of the like attention to detail and like everything matters and fashion and clothing. Yeah. Where not only did you make these zines, nice. I, I had to stop nice. and think I, I was going <laughs> to say call yourself, but not only did you make these zines, you took it a step further because throughout all of this, you're shooting film, you're traveling a bunch, mm. be it with the band or just for fun you're then starting to get into fashion and yeah. clothing. But Which I have to say thank you to Japan for because Oh really? That that definitely changed my perspective on on fashion. Whoa. For sure. Going there and seeing the like combinations of pieces that people put together and like it looks like they don't care, but then finding out that it's like really important. Like people can wear whatever they want there for whatever reason it just makes sense because yeah. you, you're just like okay this world's already weird this this place is already weird and i use that in a loving term totally. but just like a it's not what i can, where i came from so you go there and you're just like okay everything is already different it makes sense that the way that they're dressing is different but then when you think about it you're just like man that's cool because it's so individualistic. It's so unique. Like everybody's style is weird, but it's not the same as anybody else's. Yeah. And I feel that way about fashion here where I'm like, okay, you can look good in a, in a shirt and t-shirt or a, a, sorry, a shirt and jeans and, you know, sneakers or whatever. You can look good. That's fine. But there's so many other ways to really express yourself yeah. through that. You know, and that's where I kind of found my love for fashion is like, dude, you know, I l think these pants are strange and they say something to me like, sure, I'm going to put them on. And like, I wouldn't have done that before I went to Japan and saw other people doing it and pulling it off and like doing it in a cool way. Wow. And judgment free too. Wow. Yeah. Because everybody's doing it. And so sometimes I feel like, okay, I might be wearing like something weird here in America or whatever. And I think know that people are kind of looking at me but at the same time i know that there are other people who are looking at me they're being like respect because you're doing something that i kind of wish that i had the balls to do or even understand because you and i were talking about this and like i am guy that wears jeans t-shirt sneakers every fucking yeah. day and like i respect and love style and i think that it adds another layer to the culture we talk about appreciating every detail yeah i think that style is a piece for sure. I think the tattoos on your arm, I think that every piece of it is another further way to express yourself and to tell your story. So yeah, jeans t-shirt is cool, 
But like when you can express who you are and you're not just trying to fit in and like ride a trend, but when you're like, this is fucking cool and I can add to my yeah. character. That's so fucking cool. It's all part of the bit, man. It's part of the bit. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Just wear some pinstripe pants every once in a while. You'll get some looks and you'll feel good. For the listener, he's wearing some pinstripe pants and he's feeling good. These he's are got my, a big old smile on his face. These are my conductor pants. Everybody <laughs> sees them. They're like, oh, this guy just got done driving a train, man. He's good. <laughs> but you know what? They're right. I did. That's my. That's another way I express myself. I don't drive a car. I actually am a train conductor. Um it's so impractical, but you've made it work for this long. Dude, so. gas prices are outrageous out it's here. It's coal, so, isn't it? Aren't you like, just... Yeah, so now I'm I'm on coal, and uh, it's working out really good for me. Holy shit. <laughs> okay, well, the piece that I was going to say about fashion is like, with another rush of blood, you just did something that blew my fucking mind. Because through fashion, you start getting into it. Mm. I had no idea that Japan was such an influencing oh, yeah. piece. I love that. Um, but you started thrifting and you started to like, not just so much buy like designer stuff or anything like that, but you really did kind of find your own style and on Instagram, like I'd, you know, follow along and you'd be doing your thing, you know, pick up some thrift things. And then out of the motherfucking blue, (laughs) I see something I've literally never seen before, which is a line, like a clothing line of another rush of blood, which ties into at least that name. Yeah. Which is a speak low lyric. A fucking course it is. <laughs> Great. Another layer. Yes. Thank you for caring. But you did a line of all thrifted shirts. Like you found secondhand shirts, did the same embroidered design, and did them on a bunch of your favorite pieces. Yeah. And it was entirely unique. Every piece was its own. And it was also uh, very, I don't know, like just in the sense of like environmentally forward, like it's all reused shit. Yeah. Yeah. I mean it just kind of combined a lot of different things that I loved. Like I started getting into fashion, you know, I love vintage, I love the vintage hunt. You yeah. know, that's really fun for me. Uh, you know, kind of tied into my zines, having the same name. Like I said, you know, another layer, I guess is what you wanted to say. It's a lyric for, from speak low. Maybe some people who bought the zine didn't even know that another rush of blood was a speak lyric, speak low lyric, but yeah, I just wanted to do something kind of unique. And I had a, an idea like, I've been thrifting like these blank t-shirts that, you know, from the eighties, nineties that are by themselves, like still desirable. You know, if you're into the vintage stuff, you know that this tag, a blank tag, you know, from the nineties still sells for like 15, 20 bucks. And I'm like, Oh, that's cool. Like it makes sense. It's a really quality garment yeah, and it's not destroyed 20 years later. You know, I so I started just picking them up when I would see him because I'm like, people are probably passing these by. It's not Tommy. It's not, you know, Polo. It's not this stuff that people who are trying to vintage resale are getting. So I'm like, okay, it's kind of a space that's not really touched right now. So I started picking up these interesting garments and I was just like, I want to do something with them. I'm going to just embroider them kind of, you know, Pick ones out that are cool, interesting, not stained, not too ripped. But if they are, like it's in a cool, interesting way. Yeah. And just make it limited, make it unique. Every piece, one of one. Like, you know, if you get one, you get one. And so I I did the same thing, you know, dropped 50. And I was like, if you want one, be on it because I feel like people were interested in it. And so then I did a photo shoot where I had my buddy, you know, model a couple of these and took some film pictures of him and I just kind of put, you know, it's all, it's all things that I'm interested in and it gives me an avenue to do all of them. Yeah. And I don't have to ask anybody to help me with it. And that's, what's most interesting and fun about it to me is I can take pictures of my friend in the way that I want to wearing something that I made and I had fun. I had so much fun doing it. I thrifted all those pieces over the course of, you know, two or three months. Like, yeah, I didn't know what I was going to do with them until it clicked. Yeah, And then I was like, oh, now I can do all these other things that I'm interested in on top of it to make it, you know, a package. Yeah. So God, I feel like there's just a lesson in that somewhere too, right? To just like stay true to yourself and like to just fuck with the hobbies that you fuck with. And like, I feel like you're such a good example of what happens when you do just fully fucking immerse yourself in a certain hobby. I mean... I'm still like figuring out what it means to, to do all of that too. Like, I don't think I'm, 
a pro at any of that. I don't think I'm a pro. There's still so much I need to learn about photography. There's so much to learn about fashion and even, you know, claiming to be into the vintage stuff. Like there are so many brands I don't know and things about, you know, garments and whatnot. Like it's all a learning curve. And that's kind of what is the most fun about getting into something is like, if you dive in deep enough, like you will learn, like if you care enough, you can, you know, figure it out. You're just, I love, I guess I love that example that you set because there can be such like, it's like we're in an age where so much information is available and like you could really do anything, but there's almost like this like crippling, uh, not fear, but it's like, there's so much available that it's hard to commit or you don't know. Overwhelming. Yeah. And I love the example that you set of just like, you find something that you're interested in and you actually commit and you try it. Yeah. Cause you just said it like you didn't know that it was good. Ge- you didn't know film photography was going to lead to, I mean, not that it led to Japan, but like you didn't know that you were going to love taking photos, that you were going to love mm. the fashion there, that you were going to make a z- zine. <laughs> you, you have to break the habit. Um, you didn't know that. And then you did, and you just put it all together. And if you hadn't taken the first step, you wouldn't have seen the second, you right. wouldn't have seen the third. And it's like, now here you are. And like, you made those and, it leads to my next question of just like, what do you think is next? I don't know, man. I don't know. Something, something to add on to that. Like I want to just keep moving forward. I want to do these things that I love like as a passion. Like I don't ever want it to get to a point where I don't love doing it anymore. And cause I think once I, once, once you get to that point, it's not worth doing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we'll see. We'll see, man. I just, like I said, this is my second day out here in LA. Just moved here. Kinda yeah. Just wanted a, a new chapter. Yeah. And uh, I'm excited about like the collaborations out here, you know, hanging out with friends, making art with them, because I think that's, that'll probably have an effect on or an influence on what what happens next. That's so true, right? Like I didn't even think about that. And like, it's almost like, I, I feel bad that, I'm so used to just being here now that and like seeing you here, I'm like, well, yeah, of course you're here. But again, to put myself in your shoes, this is your second day here. Thank you for caring to come do the podcast that early. Dope. Of course. But like, this is only your second day. Yeah. And if we look back at the patterns and everything that you've said that has inspired you from literally the day that you saw the shirt, the band shirt, when you needed to know about it, it's like, who knows who you meet here or what you see here. Right that does inspire that next thing that you like do have the grit and courage to commit to. You better watch out, man. I'm starting a podcast. Oh my God. Let's go. (laughs) I'm just kidding. Dude, for real though, the podcast community has been fucking sick. If you want to start one, let's go. I'll teach you. We can do one together. It's so much We're doing one together. Oh yeah. 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 I forgot. I thought we were just talking. No, but that's, that's (laughs) what I'm saying. Like second day out in LA and I'm like, Hey, my friend is making something. I want to be a part of it. Like, let's go. Fuck. That's cool. So, Thanks for having me, dude. You, I thank you. Not like, that I'm trying is... to end your podcast. I no, know I want you to end it the way you want to, but I'm like, thank you regardless for having me. On no, your podcast. yeah, like that. You're so welcome, and like I, this is the exact story that I want to tell. Like to me, I don't know entirely like who the listener is, but yeah. like I in my head, I think of like the listener that I want, and I want it to be a kid like us in like high school where you're just like you're finding your first thing Mm -hmm. and you're starting to obsess over it. Right. And I want it to be one more piece of information that gives them a gem, a nugget, a something that gives them another piece that unlocks something or just the inspiration to be like, yo, this fucking sucks Mm -hmm. right now or I'm lost, but I need to keep going. Love that. Because even right here, like we don't know, right? Like both of us are like, yeah, I don't know what's next, but like I'm just going to keep going. Mm -hmm. And I think it's also cool because we have been friends for like five years now and like you never stop learning about your friends. And so like actually having like a dedicated conversation like this to where you're like, let me know more about your story. Like even if they are these small insignificant things, they're things that are worth talking about. Dude. Yes. So that was, that was cool. Dude. I, you get it. You fucking get it. So yeah. Like honestly, the last piece that I've kind of been trying to end with is like, I think that throughout your life, like there's been a really cool theme of like pieces connecting, but like if you could go back to the spot of Ryan in the most turmoil or like the most uncertainty, 
and give him any advice now? Like what spot is that for you in your life? And what would you say to that, Ryan? It's kind of a loaded question. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't know. I think the maybe the spot I was most I I was met with the most turmoil was. It's it's kind of actually always been, like a, for me it's like a religious thing. Whoa! Because I grew up in, like I grew up in the church. I grew up with religious parents. And for me, it's always been like kind of trying to find what that means to me and not following, you know, what not 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 following what my parents are following, but doing it for for myself. So if I if I subscribe to it, it's because of me. If not, it's because of me. So, I mean, that's an ongoing thing in my life, I think, even still. And, you know, I find myself having conversations or having thoughts about, you know, Am I thinking this way because of the way I was raised, or am I not doing this because you know it would, it would disappoint my parents or something like that? Blah blah blah. Um, you know, I write a lot of songs about f- trying to figure out my way through life with faith or lack thereof. You know, and uh, I think in high school was where I was having the most turmoil because I had a lot of doubts and I had a lot of questions and I didn't feel like that was okay. And then I met a lot of people who, that were older than me, that were kind of mentors to me, that told me that it was okay and explained to me, but as long as you keep searching, as long as you don't become complacent, okay, I have this doubt or I have this question, as long as you actively seek out trying to find an answer to it, then it's okay. And I think that's what I would tell myself, you know, then and still now, like, if you have something that you need to figure it out, or if you have something that you want to figure out, just keep going. Just just actively do it. Don't say you're going to do it. Don't become complacent. And don't become down on yourself because it's hard. Just live it out. Like, just, just figure it out. What an honest fucking answer. Like, damn. One, I feel bad for missing that part of your life and not covering that. Dude, like as that's you, a whole nother conversation. <laughs> I know. We can have that yeah, conversation again. another time. <laughs> but like, I just, I honestly, like, I love that answer and like, it's so honest and I just, I feel it. And I'm so glad you said that because I do think that that's an entirely like, so many people feel that and so many kids growing up. Like, I personally, like, I feel like religion is there to help you and you're allowed mm-hmm. to believe in whatever you want but it's there to help you. Right. And like, it shouldn't be a thing, but it's or a, sh- a thing that like fucks you up or yeah. like where it like, causes you doubt, but growing up in a religious family and like growing up, like there really is a point where you have to decide for yourself what's real and true to you. Of course. That's, I fucking love that. Damn, dude. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a whole nother podcast we can talk about. Yeah, fuck. I mean, we might have to do a round two, but <laughs> Part two. I, I love like I love just that answer and like I think you said that so beautifully and that's thanks. Really cool to hear. Cool. I mean, yeah, it's that's just that's as you can tell, still pretty important to me. So Yeah. Fuck man. Now I have to like go through and listen to all your lyrics again and like think about this. It, it's all connected, man. It's Holy. all connected. Fuck. <laughs> I that's why I love you. That's awesome. I love you. Man. Well, I think we did the thing. Yes, that was a good one. Fuck yeah. All right. Thanks well, for dude, ask me some questions. Welcome to fucking LA. Let's do it. There it is. All right. Well, thank you for being here and answering my questions. You're welcome. You found one of your friends. Yeah. He's right here. You get it. That's the name of it. We tied a thing into it. All right. Over and out. <laughs> So there you have it, my pal Ryan. I really hope you enjoy the episode. I just, I admire so much his attention to detail and his care and everything that he does. I think there's so many valuable lessons in just that. And he's just such a genuine dude. So I hope that that translated and inspired you. If it did and you want to keep up with him, his social media is at Ryan Scott Graham. It's probably best to just follow that. You'll find all of his other projects through that. Uh, He's actually leaving... When this comes out, 
he will probably be on a flight to Europe to start a state champs headliner throughout all of the UK and Europe into some festivals. After that, he goes on the Sad Summer Tour, which is state champs, Mayday Parade, The Main, and The Wonder Years. So that's going to be a crazy one. Go see him at a show. And like I always say, if you like the episode, please share it. It helps so, so much. So uh, my social media is at Andrew underscore FTW. Uh, I keep up. I look through everyone posting about the podcast. I, I love to see it. So I think that says it all. Again, really hope you enjoyed it. And I'll see you next week. <laughs>